Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, April 29th, 2014, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, the White House calls for Chinese-style internet censorship. Then, anti-immigration leaflets spark calls for hate crime charges. And the Senate refuses to reveal the official numbers of drone strike victims. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Standby technicians watching and high-fiving while you and your family's car is shot up by drone robot control 50 cal. Testing is set to begin next month on a pilot program that could lead to the introduction of a Chinese-style internet ID system. Now, we've reported on this before. We've said it's coming. And... So it begins. Now, the White House's National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, it'll replace the current system of using passwords to access sensitive online accounts. It'll be using something more akin to a biometric ID card. It'll link one individual to all of their government services like welfare and food stamps, as well as a myriad of other things like any mortgage applications and applications for licenses. Now, if successful, it could pave the way for an interoperable authentication protocol that would work from any website, from your Facebook account to your health insurance company. Now, back when the NSTIC plan was first introduced, CNET's Declan McCullough noted that it represented the virtual equivalent of a national ID card because it'll eventually be mandatory to use for filing any IRS tax returns, applying for benefits, or renewing licenses. And of course, we've reported about the Trans-Pacific Partnership creating an internet police who will basically have the authority to shut down entire websites as well as delete any content and censor information that it sees as threatening. So presumably, these same people could authorize your accessing the internet at all. If they deem you to be a domestic terrorist, they just might decide to cut off your access altogether, seeing as how it's a privilege granted by the state. Just look at what's happening in Russia. They are also cracking down on internet dissent. This happened very quickly today. Russia's upper house of parliament approved a law that will impose stricter rules on blogs and websites that attract more than 3,000 daily visits. Opponents say the law will enable Putin to silence any opponents who are rarely given airtime on their mostly state-controlled or pro-Putin television channels. And according to a prominent Russian blogger, the new policy is to restrict free information exchange and restrict express expression of opinion, be that in written text, speech, or video. And of course, this is what we see going on in China as well, which is what they are trying to push here for America. Now, according to Putin, the internet is a CIA project. And of course, that's why he's doing this. Now, he isn't wrong to have any concern over that, but it's clear that this is more about cracking down on dissent. And of course, that's what is being pushed here for America as well. And the government, they are going to get it via, you know, be it axing net neutrality or by just completely cutting off any access to the internet by creating this online ID that you have to apply for and be approved for in order to access information because that is the problem. They know that knowledge is power and they don't want you to have access to all of the information that's out there on the internet. That's why the drone strike issue is such a huge hot button for them. The Senate has even agreed with the intelligence chief James Clapper on this. They agreed that the American people should not know the number of people that are killed by U.S. drone attacks overseas, nor should they hope to understand the circumstances under which such lethal killings are authorized or executed. Now, U.S. senators removed a provision from a major intelligence bill that originally required the president to issue an annual public report clarifying the total number of combatants and non-combatant civilians that are killed or injured by drone strikes in the previous year. But Senate leaders removed this language because they're preparing to bring the bill to the floor for a vote. And at the behest of James Clapper, he assured them in a recent letter that the Obama administration was looking for its own ways to disclose more about its highly controversial drone strikes. So now they've got to figure out what kind of spin they can put on the murdering of innocent civilians in other countries. So 
you know, these people, they may or may not pose an active threat to our national security, but, you know, we don't know because there's no transparency in that either. Now, Zeke Johnson of Amnesty International said, it's stunning that after all these years, we still don't know how many people the Obama administration has killed with drones. Now, there are some other independent websites out there. I know there's a Twitter account that tries to publish the account of, you know, in newspapers, they might say how if their civilians were killed in drone strikes. And that's really the only access people have to any of that information. We're not going to obviously be getting it from the Obama administration, you know, the most transparent administration ever as we were promised. But of course, they they realize that if we do see how many people are actually being killed with this lethal weaponry, these unmanned drones, we would be outraged. There would be a lot of concern there. And not to mention the fact that it is the very killing of innocent people in these other countries that are just is causing more people to join Al Qaeda and to join these groups that are anti-USA that, you know, hate us for our freedom. And we are allowing our government to create that. Now, what's going to happen when these countries get drones? Are we going to have the same sort of casual reaction when innocent children are killed on our streets here in America? Now, according to analysts, they predict that in less than a decade's time, the United States will spend less than half the global total on drone research and development. Asia in particular, is expected to surge ahead, and South Korea is set to produce suicide drones. Now, all the countries, all the countries are getting in on drones now. They all want them. Major world powers are expected to have much larger drone fleets by 2022, and unmanned systems could make up 50% of the aircraft of some militaries by 2030, according to data. War is peace, y'all, and the major players, they all just want the biggest, baddest equipment with which to drop all of those love bombs down on all of our heads. So thank you, U.S. government, creating a lot of enemies for us worldwide. Now, just like Congress wants to withhold the drone strike death numbers, they don't want to, um, you know, let us know the high cost of some of the other programs of the Obama administration. That's why they've delayed the Obamacare mandates into going into effect until after the election so that voters won't be able to take their frustrations out at the polls. And now the GOP has accused the EPA of doing the exact same thing, delaying their major climate rules as well until after the election. And this time they say that they lied about it. The EPA published its so-called new source performance standard for power plants in early January, which was more than two months after it was submitted to the Federal Register. And that was even before the EPA announced that the standard, which would effectively ban coal-fired power plants, they announced that in late September. So this is months, months past. And the EPA chief, Gina McCarthy, told lawmakers she published the new rules in a timely manner. Now, Republicans, they want to know why, because they allege that the delay in publishing the NSPS was politically motivated, arguing that the Obama administration's actions will push the finalizing of the costly rule until after the elections this fall, thereby lessening the impact of the president's environmental policies, much like he is trying to lessen the impact of some of his other policies. Now, why are they doing this? Why is this going to be something that's going to possibly cost the election coming up? Because the EPA's policies will result in the shutdown of coal-powered plants, resulting in a 150 percent increase in the price for natural gas, and that will be accompanied by a 7 percent rise in electricity prices. That's according to government data. Now, what we're seeing now is like the average natural gas prices at about 344 BTU in 2012. That's going to rise upwards to $6 by 2025. This would boost retail electricity rates for households by 7%. Now, as even more coal plants are going to be shut down, gas and power prices will drive even higher by 2040. Natural gas prices will increase 150% over their 2012 levels and a 22% higher increase for retail power prices. 
Now, a number of coal plants are set to retire in April, which is troubling news for regulators who say that if we continue to experience these extreme weather conditions like we had last year with the polar vortex, we could be experiencing blackouts, rolling blackouts nationwide. Now, states already were not prepared to supply natural gas to homes. Next year could be even worse. So it doesn't really do us a lot of good to just push back these mandates and to delay the effects of these failed policies. Basically, it's just rendering us unable to prepare ourselves to respond in a timely fashion and to be prepared for a pending energy crisis. Now, much like many of this current administration's policies, we're just going to have to wait and see. Now, something else we're going to have to wait and see what the long-term effects will be is long-term exposure to electromagnetic frequencies. Now, it's everywhere. We're constantly being attacked. We've got Wi-Fi. We've got cell phone towers. Now we're going to have RF frequency of smart meters attached to our homes, and there's even a new new wave of smart meters coming, even bigger and better, supposedly. So. We are the long-term test subjects. We are the test subjects that are experiencing this technology for the first time. We have no idea how this is going to play out. Cancer from cell phone use doesn't typically appear until decades afterward. So I'm going to be speaking with Dr. David Carpenter. He is going to be speaking with us to dispel a lot of the myths surrounding these so-called scientific studies. There's a lot of misinformation out there. and. He says that the notion that there are no risks posed by this constant barrage of electromagnetic frequency is false and that we should all be very concerned, especially our children. So that is coming right up after this. From the water table, to our soils, to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that six million Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. A chemical spill contaminating the water supply in nine West Virginia counties. This year alone, over 300,000 people in West Virginia had their drinking water contaminated. What are the health effects of having these drugs in our drinking water? It's forced medical treatment without the consent of residents. My friends, water filtration is one of the most basic actions you can take to protect you and your family from the harmful toxins and heavy metals in your tap water. On average, the county says it sprays with the glyphosate at least once a week. Few filters cut out the glyphosate that is found in water supplies worldwide. Remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, hydrofluorosilicic acid, sodium hexafluorosilicate. Fluoride it is in tea, it's in coffee, it's in water, it's in bread, it's in toothpaste. It is our responsibility to protect our families. The establishment's not going to do it. It's time to take action. It's time to filter our water. For a limited time, use the promo code WATER15 and get 15% off on all ProPure systems at InfoWarsStore.com or call toll-free 888-253-3139. In this day and age, we are facing a constant barrage of electromagnetic frequency. It's all around us, from citywide cell towers to Wi-Fi in every classroom. Now we've got RF pulsating smart meters attached to our homes that we can't opt out of. And we're really being sold on all of the benefits that this advance in technology is going to have, while there isn't a lot of research into the risks. 
Now joining me today is Dr. David Carpenter. He is the director at the Institute for Health and the Environment at the University of Albany. He has been involved since the 1980s in the research surrounding electromagnetic frequencies and electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And he's gonna be joining us today to dispel some of the misinformation out there surrounding these technologies. Well, doctor, thank you so much for joining us today. So we have got so many conflicting reports coming out you know, they're saying cell phones could cause impotence, it could cause cancer, and then other studies are saying, no, there's no correlation whatsoever. Why are there such conflicting reports? Well, there are a variety of reasons. In the first place, you don't get a positive result in every study, even when there are associations that are real. Uh, it can be a, a matter of poor exposure assessment, it can be a matter of, of too few cases and that sort of thing. In my judgment, the evidence is overwhelming that long-term cell phone use causes an increased risk of brain cancer. And part of the evidence that it's real is the fact that it only shows up on the side of the head that people normally use their cell phone on. Now, for adults, it does require using a cell phone for a long period of time. The evidence is strongest after 10 or more years or 1,600 and something hours. Uh, so it, it's a prolonged exposure. Uh, but the, the big concern are the few studies that are now appearing that show that when individuals under the age of 20 use a cell phone even for a shorter period of time, the risk that they will develop brain cancer is even greater than it is with adults, some five-fold greater. And it appears that older adults are less at risk than younger adults even for the same period of time. And this is totally consistent with what we know about other sources of exposure that lead to things like cancer, that children are by far the most vulnerable. And as, as time goes on, our bodies are, are growing less, our cells are dividing less, and there's not the same level of risk. Right. Now, yes, uh, uh, and you asked me another question, which I think is a very important one, which was, uh, which are the really dangerous frequencies? Mm -hmm. And the problem is we can't really answer that. Uh, I'm increasingly impressed that the kinds of cancer we see are pretty much the same, no matter what the frequency of exposure is. Uh, the evidence is very strong that uh, 60 hertz power line magnetic fields increases the risk of childhood leukemia. Now we're finding that People that live near very powerful AM radio transmission towers, Vatican Radio, for example, a uh, number of powerful stations in Korea, uh, the children that live near those towers develop leukemia more frequently than children that live far away. And furthermore, the relative risk goes down along with distance from the tower. So in both of these circumstances, the whole body is being exposed, and it appears that leukemia is the cancer of greatest concern. Now, I already said that for the cell phones, it's brain cancer we're concerned about. But there is less strong evidence than for leukemia, but there's evidence for elevations in brain cancer risk around the 60 hertz magnetic fields as well. That's both with children and with adults from occupational exposure. So I don't think that the frequency is so important. The issue of smart meters is a very interesting one. And again, we don't have a lot of studies specifically on smart meters. My big concern about smart meters is that these use very high intensity pulses. They're very brief, but they're extremely high intensity. And all of the standards are set for the aggregate exposure levels, which do fall below the FCC standards. But there is a building body of evidence, not by any means conclusive yet, that these transients, these sudden rises and falls, especially at high intensity, are much more dangerous than a steady sine wave, which is what we think of for when we talk about electromagnetic fields. Uh, that re to, to prove that requires studies of people specifically exposed to smart meters. And of course, that's going to be very difficult to do. 
because none of us are only exposed to one source of electromagnetic fields. Uh, we have the magnetic fields from the electricity in our homes and offices. We have cell phones, we have Wi-Fi, we have cell towers, we have smart meters, we have radar, we have all kinds of exposures to different frequencies. And uh, again, one of the problems is that it's almost impossible to accurately measure the total aggregate exposure. However, when there is inadequate exposure assessment in epidemiological studies, one can be certain if you still find statistically significant associations in the presence of inadequate exposure assessment, then the true risk is going to be much greater than what you would obtain in those studies with flawed assessment of what the actual exposure is. Right, and we're finding that a lot of these studies are actually put on by the wireless carriers who are, of course, are going to want to have a positive review of, of their product. But short of moving to a rural area, what can people do to protect themselves? Uh, we're hearing a lot, a lot more reports of this electro hypersensitivity. Well, you know, even moving to a rural area isn't going to be very satisfactory because, uh, it, for example, with use of a cell phone, the further you are away from the cell tower, uh, the stronger the signal that generates is generated in the phone. So uh, mm -hmm. and there are cell towers just about everywhere now. Uh, so what can people do? Well, I think there are a number of things you can do that are relatively benign. Uh, you can avoid use of a cell phone except when it has a wired earpiece, a wired connection. Uh, there's no exposure from wired connections. Uh, you can avoid having Wi-Fi in your house. Or if you have Wi-Fi, you can put the router away from the areas that people are in. Uh, I think one thing that I see as being very dangerous, again, we don't have the solid experimental evidence, but the fact that the whole country, uh, and supported by the initiatives from the Obama administration, the whole country is, is in a push to have Wi-Fi computer classrooms. Now, I'm 100% in favor of having every, every school child have access to the internet and learn to use computers, but it doesn't have to be Wi-Fi. It can be wired. And uh, there is so much evidence that at least some people, if not everybody, is going to be adversely affected by the excessive radio frequency fields that you would have if you have a computer classroom where 20 kids or 30 kids are sitting on their wireless laptops generating a room just chock full of radio frequency radiation. Right, and I, I hear a lot of the argument there is that it'll be more expensive to get, get the classroom hardwired, but it really, over the long term, it seems the cost would offset itself, just concerns for your health. Well, that's exactly right. You know, what, what is the cost of having a child develop leukemia? Uh, what is the cost of having a child in school whose learning ability is impaired because of these radio frequency radiations? Now, I need to say there that the evidence for uh, uh, EMFs impairing cognitive function is still quite weak, but there is enough evidence so that parents and teachers and school administrators should be concerned about that. And then we have this issue which is still controversial of electrohypersensitivity, that some people are unusually sensitive to electromagnetic fields, whether power line fields or radio frequency fields, and just feel ill. They, they feel mentally dull, they have headaches, they have aches and pains, uh, sometimes they're nauseous, often they have ringing in their ears, uh, and they just feel unwell. Uh, now, I, I get calls regularly from electrosensitive people. Now, they're often referred by their physician to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. uh, with the thought that this is just psychosomatic. Now, for some people, it may well be psychosomatic, but I'm convinced for other people it is not, that this is a real syndrome where uh, some people respond to these fields with a greater intensity than do others. Uh, and I think that as a, 
as a nation that tries to reduce exposures and harm to people, we should be regulating on the basis of those that are most vulnerable and most sensitive to these, these fields. I get calls all the time from people that want to know, you know, where can I go to live? Because I can't stand living where I am because of the neighbor's uh, smart meters, the Wi-Fi in the community, the cell tower next door, the cell tower on the roof of my apartment, uh, this kind of thing. And there aren't easy answers to those people, but they are clearly suffering. Uh, most of them, I suspect, from the radio frequency radiation or the power line radiation. Perhaps some of them are just uh, people that are ill for other reasons and want to blame the EMFs. But uh, I don't think that, that the, radi the electrohypersensitivity can be passed off as being only a psychosomatic disease. It's not. Absolutely, and especially as there's such a, a strong push now to get the entire country on the grid, even though we have these vulnerabilities with, with hacking and things like that, but just at the very base level, there are genuine concerns for people's health. Well, doctor, where can people go to learn more? Do you have a website that you can uh, let people know where they can get a little more information? Well, I think the major website I would refer you to is that of the Bioinitiative Report. It's www.bioinitiative.org. It's an encyclopedic uh, review of the literature on, on all EMF effects. Uh, it was initially published in 2007. It was updated in 2012. And there's a very recent 2014 update on that website. Uh, I'm always available to be contacted at dcarpenter at albany.edu. Uh, I have uh, some publications in peer-reviewed journals that I've written that, that uh, describe how I see this issue. I testified on this issue before the President's Cancer Panel a couple of years ago. Uh, so I, it's, it's a very important issue, and I think there are a number of things that individuals can do to reduce their exposure, to reduce the exposure of their families without uh, giving up uh, a contemporary style of life. We're not going to go back to a pre-wireless age, but we should respect the fact that wireless communication and electricity have associated with it risks for some people, maybe not for everybody, but certainly risks for some, and there's no evidence that the cancer risk, while it may be small relative to other cancer risks, there's no evidence that anyone is immune from, from that risk. Right. So there are things to do. Yes, and especially with our children who, who, as you say, they're the ones who are becoming extremely susceptible to this and are the most who are going to be using all of this technology. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and for everything you're doing. And it's my pleasure. Me. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. While it is important for us to remember that we are dealing with a relatively new technology, so I would always err on the side of caution. Like Dr. Carpenter said, it could take decades for the effects of exposure to EMFs to reveal themselves as cancer or neurological disorders. Basically, we are currently the long-term test study. So which control group are you going to be in when the data adds up? Well, thanks for watching the show tonight, and we will see you here tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central. Hi, I'm Shane Steiner. A lot of you have been following my progress using Super Male Vitality. The last 19 weeks has been an incredible experience. I was feeling a little down and lethargic during the holidays, and none of the supplements that I was taking were doing any good. That's when my longtime friend from high school, Alex Jones, introduced me to Super Male Vitality. I was a little skeptical at first. Not only would I have the energy to work out and go to the gym, but it, it was actually the changes were happening to my body. Uh, a lot more rapidly. My whole mood, my libido, everything had completely changed. The concentrated organic herbs, they stimulate your natural systems to produce the natural hormones that you need. I just really wanted to, to bulk up and hit it hard and I went in for about the first five weeks and was lifting heavy weight and just really hitting it hard and I gained 20 pounds of muscle immediately. Since that, I've decided I was gonna lose some weight and slim down. I just changed up my workout a little bit and 35 pounds came off. Folks, this is not a joke. This is not a gimmick, it's real. Super Male Vitality, available at InfoWarsLife.com.
here today talking to people, asking them about the situation with the Veterans Affairs Office and whether or not it's okay for our soldiers to come back from overseas and not get the health care they need. It's pretty ridiculous. Let's see what people out here have to say. Do you think it's right that our veterans come home from combat and just the veterans from Vietnam till now aren't able to get the health care they need? I don't think that's right. I feel like they should get the health care they need. Well, I do too. Well, yesterday CNN came out with a report that the Veterans Affairs Office in Phoenix, Arizona had what they like to call a secret list. And in that secret list, it had 1,600 soldiers. And out of those 1,600 soldiers, 40 have died now. And they put them on the list because they figured that they didn't need to get the health care. So it's kind of like, you know, some of you are okay to be seen, some of you aren't. So it's basically like a death panel. How do you feel about that? You know, that our heroes come back from over there and they don't get the treatment they need. I don't think that's right. I definitely think they should get the treatment they need. Uh, if they're serving our country and protecting us, then they should be held above us. Of course not. Of course not. I did hear of it. It was in Arizona or something like that. Yes, in Phoenix. Yeah. No, I definitely don't think they should be treated that way. Um, Do you have Obamacare? No, I don't. Well, you know, for the rest of Americans who are getting it and the ones that ask for it, that is government-run health care. That's what our soldiers have been dealing with for years now. That's what the rest of America has to look forward to. I have no, no comment. It seems pretty serious, but I'm... I mean, do you think our soldiers that fight for our country should be treated this way? Uh, probably not. Not enough. Well, I've been doing it almost 10 years, uh, especially my benefits. And, yeah, and you know, it took a while for me to even get 10%. So tell me about your friend. You said he has some issues with the uh, VA's office and how they're, it, they're uh, prescribing him medication that's making him, you said, a little off, a little loopy? Yes, he was uh, in Iraq and he's receiving medication for the bipolar thing that was increased uh, in the time he was in the war and he's already taking care of it. He has not solved the problem. So the, the medication that the VA is not helping him out at all whatsoever, it's making him worse? Yeah, he thinks so. He want to quit the medication, but they insist that he should keep on trying with the medication and not stop it. That's, that's astounding, dude. Like, I, I, we, here in America, we're, we're going through all this stuff about how we're trying to better our health care and how everybody needs it. And, I, and for our veterans, to, like, this to be happening to veterans, I'm just... Uh, I'm, I'm a loss of words right now. Well, that is government-run health care. Right now we have a skyrocketing uh, amount of suicides from veterans. Do you think that we should be limiting the amount of uh, deployments we give our soldiers? I say that we need to do what's best for the country and other countries. But I mean for the soldiers themselves. I mean, they're the ones who get sent over there to fight for us. Yeah. I mean, do you think that we should be, when they come home, prescribing them drugs that on the bottle clearly says causes anxiety, causes depression? It depends on the doctor. The doctors obviously know what they're doing, and they're going to prescribe drugs that are supposed to help the situation for those individual soldiers, for their needs. Right. I have heard of it, and um, unfortunately, it concerns me that that's what's going to happen to our medical system across the country, too. Yeah, that's what, that's what most people aren't really, you know, putting together that that's government-run health care, yeah. that's what Obamacare is going to be, and people just seem to be all, you know, happy about it, but they don't understand that, you know, someone like me that's a vet that's been going through that for 10 years, I'm not getting any help at all. So, you know, no one else is going to be getting that now. No, it's just going to get worse, believe me. I'm, I'm worried. It's a telltale thing of what is to come in full effect when we get uh, Obamacare. It's all selective. You're not getting everything that's being promised you. You're going to be on a list for certain things. If you're going to be in a need for emergency surgeries, there's going to be people ahead of you, even though you can afford it. If not, it's all going to be selective. The doctors and everything through that healthcare system also are going to be able to pick who can live and who can die if your situation is um, uh, vastly important to them or not. Uh, you know, basically on their agenda. Yeah, basically it's a death panel. I mean, they said that they were, health care is not important for young and for old. So essentially we're just saying that we can pick and choose who we want to take care of and everyone else is just left to die. I mean, it's a horrible thing. Thank you, Obama. Yeah, no, I, I agree, but at the same time you can't, like the idea of 
throwing the baby out with the bathwater, like government screws everything up, therefore we can't trust them to do anything right. I mean, I hate to say it, but we do have a pretty solid, though broken sometimes, infrastructure. We have running water and electricity. Our government does do a lot of things well. If we gave it the power to do things correctly, then maybe we would all get the health care we needed, including our veterans. Do you, do you think it's okay that our veterans that serve and fight for our country overseas come back home and they're denied health care? I'm good. Well, they're not good. They need your help. Right, we've been out here today talking to people about the veterans and how they're not getting proper health care and how that ties into government-run health care, i.e. Obamacare. This is what we have to look forward to in America. My friends, Alex Jones here to tell you about some of the most important information concerning you and your family's health. Radiation levels have more than doubled in the last 60 years in the Northern Hemisphere from all of the nuclear testing and radiological accidents. Radioactive contamination is now in most of the food supply. There's only two ways to avoid this. Move south of the equator or properly protect your thyroid with nascent iodine. Looking to protect my family, I've done deep research. Nascent iodine is the purest, cleanest, absolute best form of iodine to protect yourself and your family. It's made right here in the USA, completely non-GMO. I searched out the best quality and now have developed a double strength form of nascent iodine exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Nascent iodine is on record as one of the only safe ways to detox from fluoride poisoning. Survival Shield Nascent Iodine. Secure your super high quality nascent iodine today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. An often overlooked link that ties many domestic terror suspects together is their relationship with federal authorities. Case in point, the recent shooter in Kansas. It's been reported that Fraser Glenn Cross, originally Fraser Glenn Miller, became a federal flunky to reduce his jail time for KKK activities years ago. Upon his release from jail, reports claim Cross became a paid informant until the shootings in Overland Park, Kansas, where he targeted the Jewish community. From shootings to bombings, lawyers for alleged Boston bomber Johar Zarnayev say that the FBI had numerous contacts with their client's older brother, Tamerlan. This fits in with the mother of the Zarnayev brothers stating that the FBI contacted Tamerlan after the bombings and before he was listed as a suspect. Not to mention Tamerlan attending CIA-sponsored workshops and the DHS and FBI being briefed to Tamerlan's activities well before the bombing in Boston. But sometimes feds need their informants active on the digital plane. Court documents show that Hector Monsinger, the FBI informant who ratted out hackers from the group's LulzSec and Anonymous, directed hundreds of cyber attacks against the government websites of Iran, Syria, Pakistan, Brazil, and others. And if you're convinced that all of the prior are simply isolated incidents, watch this. If you ask the leadership of the FBI, most of whose field agents are tireless, dedicated, constitution-supporting professionals, it will tell you that it, the FBI, has foiled about 17 plots to kill Americans during the past 10 years. What it will not tell you is that there have been 20 foiled plots, and of them, three were interrupted by members of the public. The 17 that were interrupted by the feds were created by the feds. One of the incidents Judge Napolitano goes on to point out is the underwear bomber. InfoWars talked with eyewitness Kurt Haskell about what he saw on the underwear bomber flight. In January 2010, we had hearings in Congress on this where we had Under Secretary of State Patrick Kennedy come out. And if you watch the video of him, it's pretty telling that he's trying to uh, cover up something and not tell the truth. He's squirming in his chair and seems really uncomfortable answering the questions. And this video is all over the internet if you want to Google it and look at it. But what he said is basically, you know, we knew Abdul Mutalab was a terrorist. We wanted to stop him from coming in the country and revoke his visa. There have been numerous cases where our unilateral and uncoordinated revocation of a visa would have disrupted important investigations that were underway by one of our national security partners. They had the individual under investigation, and our revocation action would have disclosed U.S. government's interest in that individual and ended our colleagues' ability, such as the FBI, to pursue the case quietly and to identify terrorist plans and co-conspirators. But we had a request from an intelligence agency, and he didn't say which one. What he said was, we'll talk about it in closed session. 
And he said, we had a request from an intelligence agency that they're tracking Abdul Mutalab. They, uh, they want to let him into the U.S. to follow him and to catch bigger fish. And they honored that request in order to let whatever intelligence agency do their business so that they wouldn't knock out one lone soldier in the war on terror and they could essentially follow him in the U.S. and catch accomplices. So that's what they admitted to. But Patrick Kennedy went on to say, there's more to this we need to talk about in closed session, and that's kind of where it ended. So uh, obviously, I don't believe that for a minute. Uh, what uh, I believe through and what's been shown through the evidence, I believe, is that an intelligence agency gave Abdul Mutalab an intentionally defective bomb and put him on the plane to stage a fake terrorist attack. And we'll end looking at the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Last winter, the FBI was praised for its speed in cracking the case of the World Trade Center bombing and bringing four suspects to trial. Now, there is some evidence that the FBI may have known of the plot in advance through an informant and might, might even have stopped the bombing that killed six people. FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. Unbeknownst to the FBI at the time, Salem recorded many of his conversations with his handlers. You got paid regularly for, for good information. Uh, if that's what you think, guys, uh, is fine. But I don't think that because we was start already building the bomb which is went off in the World Trade Center. Uh, it was built by uh, uh, supervising, uh, supervision from the Bureau and the GA, and we was all informed about it, and we know that the bombs start to be built. By who? By your confidential informant. What a wonderful, great case. Did you hear that? The informant claims he built the bomb under the direction of the FBI. You can find more reports at Infowars.com. Celebrate the spirit of freedom and liberty upon which our nation was founded at InfoWarsShop.com. Molon Lave is ancient Greek for come and take it. This popular design combines both classic Greek Spartan imagery with modern M16 assault rifles. Now available in women's tees and proudly made in the USA. And now you can protect yourself from corrupt cops with the InfoWars dash cam. It's your car's black box that records all that the driver sees and hears. And introducing the Block It Pocket. It renders your phone undetectable while protecting your private data and your health. Or take back your privacy and protect your personal information by getting your very own detractor cell phone pouch. So get incredibly high quality freedom-based products and help fund the revolution at InfoWarsShop.com. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. Members can share their passcodes with up to 11 other people, and your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.